Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Dreamcatcher podcast, a place where your dreams can find a voice. Since the dawn of time, we humans have been fascinated with the cosmos. I'm sure that you remember looking up at the night sky as a little kid wondering, what is out there? I know I have. And as we grow up, many of us do try to seek answers by flipping through science magazines or by following NASA's newsfeed. And according to my guest today, not only is this a healthy form of curiosity, but a big source of inspiration and wonder. Abigail Harrison, fondly known as Astronaut Abby, is an aspiring astronaut, author, and co-founder of the international nonprofit organization, The Mars Generation. She holds a degree in biology, has interned at a NASA-funded astrobiology lab, and has been featured in Time, Forbes, Marie Claire, the BBC, and more. She currently works as a research scientist at Harvard Medical School. Abby believes that no one is ever too young or too old to pursue their dreams and is determined to help as many young people as possible start reaching for their very own stars. In this interview, she's going to inspire us with her philosophy and what helped her rise to the top of her field. She also discusses the importance of space exploration and why it's important and relevant in today's world. And if you like what you heard, please don't forget to like, rate, share, and subscribe to this podcast. Thanks. Hi, Abby. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It is so nice to connect with you. You know, I've been watching some of your videos and reading some of your content, and I just have to say, I'm so glad that there's someone out there who's encouraging the youth to engage in the sciences and also make it seem like it's a cool thing to do, because honestly, there aren't a lot of influencers doing that right now. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. I, it's really, that's a big part of what my goal is and, and what my hopes are in being on social media and sharing my journey and my story through science and through space exploration is to create that kind of exciting content that will capture people and especially young people. Um, and also just to be a role model to women, because of course we need more women in science and more women oh, in STEM fields who are, you know, public and who are, uh, who, who young people can look up to and can, can see. So that's, it's great to hear that, uh, that you think that about my social media, because that's the goal. Yeah. Yeah. And you're doing a great job of that. Really. You are. Oh, um, thank you. and I just, dis- and I discovered something else. We are birthday twins. Really? <laughs> yes. No way. We are. June 11th. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's exciting. <laughs> I know. I was like, go June 11th. <laughs> yeah. Cool. People are born on June 11th, right? <laughs> they sure are. <laughs> Us and Dr. Oz. The first time. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first time I've been on an interview and, and uh, heard that uh, that fun fact. That's <laughs> it's true. It's true. Although I'm yeah. uh, quite a bit older than you, but let's not get into that. <laughs> <laughs> um, <What>? No. <laughs> uh, really, I am. Okay. <laughs> All right, oh, Abby. So let's get into it. So I want to know a little bit about your background and what inspired you. You wanted to be an astronaut since you were a little girl. And not only that, you want to be the first person, one of the first astronauts to, to go to Mars. Uh, so tell us, what were the early experiences that fueled that desire? So that, yeah, you're right. That's that's the dream. That's the, the long-term goal. And it's hard to place my finger on a particular instance that really sparked that. But I have a couple of, of memories that I think from when I was really, really young that of, of instances or such that were really um, uh, indicative or that helped to form this dream and this passion. And one of them is that I was always really, I was always a really curious child. I was constantly asking why and looking at the world around me and having all of these questions. And in particular, I have this memory probably it's it's one of my earliest memories you know when you think back to like the beginning of your consciousness and you have a couple of those like key memories 
For me, one of them is when I was probably about four years old and I was standing outside on the porch in my backyard of mm-hmm. my, my mom's house and I was looking up at the night sky and I saw the stars and I was just filled with this sense of awe and wonder and also with, again, all of these questions. And all of these questions were running through my head about, are we alone in the universe? Like how, how are stars made? Like all of these things when I'm looking up and that's kind of the first instance when I had this inkling of knowing that I wanted to be a part of answering those questions and a part of exploring our solar system and our universe as a whole. Um, which is, it's funny to think that that was like one of the sparks that drove this passion because it wasn't even a very special night sky. It was, I I grew up in a city. And so when I was looking up at the sky, there were probably like five stars up there. And now that I'm older and I've gotten to do a little bit of traveling and see some dark sky sites and and do some some real astronomy and such, I I look back at that and I'm amazed that even um, such a, a, you could say, lackluster or less than extraordinary sky was able to really spark such a passion and curiosity in me. Um, I was also, like I said, it wasn't just one instance though that really sparked this passion for me. It was a variety of things. That was one of them. Another one is that I was exposed early on um, to a lot of uh, science fiction. And that was definitely something that allowed me to look at space exploration and not think about what was going on in the, the present, but instead think about what could happen in the future and to really look towards the future and say, even if we're not doing it now within my lifetime, what's possible and to really broaden my horizons um, of what it is that we as humans are capable potentially of doing. So it was, it was really a variety of, of a couple of those things. Oh, I love it. I love it. So did you have a telescope? I didn't actually, I never had a telescope, um, which is funny because then I went on to, um, be a professional telescope technician. That was my first job out of college. Oh, wow. <laughs> working for a science education nonprofit um, yeah. that where I, I used a lot of medias, including you know telescopes and solar scopes and, and planetariums and all of that to teach the public about our place in space, essentially, and, and about how connected we are to um, you know, the space around us and how it affects our everyday life, which, yeah, I I went from not having a telescope as a kid to getting to work with some telescopes that were, you know, 15 feet tall or something. (laughs) Wow. That's amazing. And were your um, people, were people around you supportive of your ambition? Yeah, I was really lucky that um, I had a lot of support around me when I was growing up. So probably my biggest supporter was and has always been and continues to be um, my mom. So Mm -hmm. I started saying that I wanted to be an astronaut, like we've mentioned when I was about maybe four, five years old. And I kept saying it for a very long period of time. And and for the first couple of years, um, my mom and also everyone else around me kind of just thought that it was a childhood fancy or that yeah. It a, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I asked like, because I, I too wanted to be an astronaut until I realized what, what it entailed. <laughs> <laughs> and my Very parents were like, we knew, one. we knew you were going to grow out of it some days. <laughs> right. And, and some kids do. That's the thing is that like a lot of kids want to be astronauts in the same way that a lot of kids want to be, you know, princesses or right. something like yeah. that, or superheroes. Like when <laughs> kids say this stuff, it's not always indicative of like a lifelong path. And so that's totally what yes. my mom thought for for like probably the first five years or so. She thought that I was just, you know, saying things and that it wasn't real. Um, but after when I was about eleven years old, I um, kept, you know, I, I'd been saying it now for five or six years. And she finally heard me one day say this and she looked at me and she said, if you actually want to do this, then you have to figure out a plan and you have to start working towards it. And she, she actually sat me down and um, she calls it the come to Jesus talk, uh, which is basically <laughs> where, where she never heard of that expression me, before. <laughs> I know, right? It's, she basically told me, um, here are the cold hard facts about becoming an astronaut. She said, there are, you know, the, in the last selection, there were thousands, tens of thousands of candidates and only eight people were chosen throughout all of history. There have been fewer than 500 astronauts. 
and only yeah. about 50 of them have been women. And she's sitting there telling me, I'm 11 years old, and she's telling me all of this stuff. And she's saying, so your chances are nearly impossible. And if, and, um, if you're going to do this, you have to start working towards it now. And you have to have a concrete plan about how you're going to achieve and accomplish this. And it sounds kind of brutal to be telling a 10 or 11 year old that. No, but, but, it was actually the kind but that's what you need to done. hear. That's what you need to hear. Because like in any field, there's stiff competition. And the sooner you can get a head start, the better. Yeah, absolutely. And also the the more in perspective you can hold your ambitions and dreams with Correct. the reality. Correct. I, I think that it's, it's not like a pie in the sky. Of, kind of right. no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> but fully appreciated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, absolutely. It's it's one of those things where like I feel like a lot of people think that when you think about the reality of a situation, it makes yeah. you less likely to reach for a dream. But I think it's the opposite. I think when you take the reality of a situation into consideration, it mm-hmm. strengths and strengthens your dream and your ability to reach for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was lucky that my mom helped me do that at a really young age. And then I came back to her the next day and I had printed out um, two different sheets of paper. One of them was uh, a path that I could take of different steps if I were to go down the military route of becoming an astronaut. And the other one was a list of steps and and options that I could take if I chose to go down the civilian and scientist route of becoming an astronaut. Um, And my mom says that that was the moment that she realized how serious I was about this and that she became my biggest supporter and like fully signed on for for my dream. Uh, And so it's, yeah, I'm really lucky that I had someone like that who was just in my corner Yes. basically from day one and, and has been an, an incredible support system for me to chase after such a big dream. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, yeah you are indeed <laughs> very lucky to have someone like that to give you that guidance so early in your life. Um, and what I love about your career trajectory is that you also decided to start a nonprofit um, called the Mars Generation, right? Yes. Um where you and your team advocate for space exploration. So I just want to know, why do you think space exploration is so important in our current times? Like, why is it relevant? Oh boy, let's see. How much time do we have? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's one of my favorite questions. And if you give us a me, top three all day. <laughs> But um, for top three, because honestly, because yeah. there are some people out there who'd be like, okay, we have enough problems on Earth, <laughs> like you know. Exactly. And why should we bother? Really common one out there. That's a really common question and such right. here in terms of space travel is like, well, what's the point? And yeah, why? Why, why, why waste so money, much going on? Why waste money on you know yeah. all these and all these endeavors? It's a valid question. I think that it's probably one of the most important questions you can ask in space and in anything is why, why are we doing it? Um, Mm. And I really think that if I were to give a top three of why, the top one has to be um, thinking about how space improves life here on earth. So space is absolutely, as we all know, a really, really difficult environment. It's incredibly hostile to humans. It is it goes to the extremes, not just of temperature, pressure, but also things like radiation and motion and all of these things. We're working at the extreme ends of all of these spectrums. And by doing that, by putting ourselves in situations that are just so difficult and so seemingly impossible, we force ourselves to think outside of the box and to be creative and to develop and to explore um, in order to not only survive, but then also thrive and have the capability to exist and work and live in space. And the reason that that is so important is that it's this kind of outward pressure of such a difficult environment that allows us to create new technologies and new solutions, potentially a lot sooner than they would have been created here on Earth. Um, and so there are a lot of these features that we see every single day now that uh, allow us to live the lives that we live and also allow us then to address some of the big issues that we're facing right now and that my generation and the next generation are really going to um, have to have to tackle. So I'm talking things like even the ability for us to talk to one another from a separate, you know, we're, we're halfway around the world we are. Uh, right now. And yeah. yet we're having this conversation and we're going to be able to share it with people and around the entire world. And that's a direct result of space exploration. That's oh. a direct result. Yeah, because the they have the satellites that we have. 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The satellites and then also down to the level of um, some of the electronics within computers, uh, mm. the ability to have um, small personal sized cameras on our phones and our computers and all of that. These things are deeply tied to space exploration. And um, it, it's it's that. It's also things like uh, having the ability to efficiently warm and cool our houses using certain kinds of insulation that was originally developed for space exploration. And now that's one of the primary features that can oh. help us to live sustainable lives and to, to fight global warming and things like that is being able to control the temperature in a way that is less detrimental to the environment. Um, we also have things like, for instance, GPS um, it does a lot of things. Most of us think of GPS as, you know, pulling up Google Maps or being able yes. to find your way from place A to B. But some of the things that we don't think about when we talk about GPS um, is the fact that GPS actually helps us to fight food shortages around the world by allowing farmers to use GPS to um, automatically uh, or not automatically to um, uh, use GPS to plant crops in optimal positioning. To, to maximize the capability of farmland to produce food. Um, so there are all of these different kinds of like outcroppings of the technologies and capabilities that we get from space exploration that we use every single day and we don't even realize that we're using. But if we had never ventured out into space, we never would have found these things or it would have taken us longer to find them because we weren't in the extreme pressures that allowed and caused us to develop those technologies. Um, and I think that that really holds true as well for what we can expect in the future is that the technologies that we need in order to face some of the problems that we're facing and will continue to, I absolutely think that those are strongly tied to space exploration, that that is one of our, our primary tools in making the future better. Um, is the ability to change the way that we do things. So that's super important. Um, another really important piece of space exploration is that it allows us to observe Earth and it mm -hmm. allows us to understand the, the planet that we live on. It's, it's actually fragile. It, it, it oh, yeah. is- um, We're becoming increasingly aware of that with everything that's going on with global warming and- Yeah, with global yeah, climate, climate change. change and with, yeah. with the, weather patterns and all of this. And it's so important that we have the ability both on a, a, on a scientific level to have data and to have observation that helps us to actually make informed decisions about what we're doing. Um, and it also is important that we're able to observe and, and view our earth for a philosophical reason of being able to look at, you know, as Carl Sagan said, the, the, pale, the pale blue marble or the pale blue oh, dot that is I love, earth. Yeah, I love, I love that question that quote or that excerpt from his book. It's, just... it's incredible and it's yeah. touching and it's moving. And it, I think seeing Earth from space, even if it's not through our own eyes, but through the eyes of our astronauts or even through mm. the eyes of satellite imagery allows us to think on a personal and individual level as well as on a community level about how important our planet is and how important it is that we all work together um, to, to protect and to nurture and to... Um, steward our, our planet. So those those are a couple. Um, I think it's also if I because I get a third one. So <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Like We're already life. convinced. We don't need more. <laughs> go for it. Talking to the well, I, now. I speak for myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that the third the third one that's really important to me, and, and again, this is one that this is maybe a little bit more up for debate than the others, but I think that it's. True, and I think you'll probably agree with me, is that space inspires. It inspires. It really does. It has a history throughout all of humanity mm. of being a part of what makes us human is this need to explore and this mm. connection that we have to the night sky. And I think that that continues even stronger into the modern day that we're living in where we actually have like space exploration and, and can interact with that. I, I just think that it inspires every single one of us and has the capability to show us that again, this is going to maybe sound cheesy, but that the sky is not the limit. And really, that happens yeah. back here on earth as well to allow people to see, and especially young people to see that we are capable of so much more than, than what we sometimes think that we're capable of. Um, and I think yeah. that that's, yeah, that's definitely a, a worthwhile reason to think about space exploration as well. 
Right. And I also love that it makes us remember that we're really one earth family, that we're all in this together rather than be focused on, you know, just to, to kind of be distracted by the things that, that kind of divide us. And I think we really need that in today's times. And I think, you know, when you look at earth from that, that space perspective, you realize, oh my God, we're just, we're just one family. We're all in this together. So one of the reasons why I love uh, learning about space and just kind of reminding myself about uh, the fact that, you know, I'm living in this pale blue dot in the middle of this, you know, black nothingness. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that it's, it is our, we can think of earth as our spaceship and we're all on it together. Yeah. And when it comes down to it, that is, it transcends borders, I, I think. And it, yes. it definitely connects us in a way that not many other things really can do. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I agree that it's, it's just such an incredible way to look at humanity and to think about ourselves as a whole and as a a worldwide community, definitely. Right. Right. Um, and what are some of the things that people can do to kind of have this cosmic perspective that you, that you just talked about? How can they be in touch with that? Because, you know, what are some of the things they can do to kind of maintain that cosmic perspective? Yeah, absolutely. So I I agree completely that sometimes the stresses of life, whether they're good or or bad stresses, um, they build up and they they weigh on you and and they make it easy for your focus and your perspective to kind of narrow sometimes. And I think space exploration is the way to to broaden that and to to find this um, this as you said this cosmic perspective. Uh, there are there are a lot of ways depending on what's available and also personal preference of how you interact with space exploration. Um, I think that some of my recommendations, uh, absolutely a big recommendation that I would have is to just get outside and stargaze a little bit to to spend time looking up at the night sky and knowing that it's the same night sky. You're looking at the same night sky as every human who's ever lived on earth before you. And I think that that's uh, definitely a way to place yourself in the context of humanity and to really think about, about um, a a bigger picture. Uh, Like I said earlier, when I was telling my story of when I was just a little kid looking at the night sky, it, it doesn't even have to be the most perfect or, you know, clean or anything like that sky that you're looking at. Although I would recommend for anyone who has the option or opportunity to find a place that has um, less light pollution and is potentially at a higher elevation and everything. Um, I think that it's almost, I, it's uh, a beautiful experience to see the Milky Way for the first time, for example. Um, some other Where do we get people- to see that? Because I've always wondered, because I know there are certain parts uh, you know, on the planet where it really, you can see it li- really clearly. I've heard that Chilean, the Chile, the, the desert in Chile is a really good place to go, but are there in any yeah. other areas where we can go? Yeah. So that's a really fantastic question. There's actually a lot of places um, where you can see the Milky Way and where you can see a really clean night sky and are able to see, for example, there are some galaxies that you can see just with the naked eye without uh, without a telescope, you can see star clusters, things like that, if you get out to the proper site. And so the the three main things that you're looking for um, to find that kind of a, a night sky, the first one is light pollution. So you want to get as far away from cities and from lights and things like that as you can. Um, the second one is elevation. So it actually matters how, what elevation you're at, because when you're stargazing, it uh, it can make a difference the amount of atmosphere between you Mm. and space and so if you're looking through less atmosphere when uh when light passes through the atmosphere it gets bent and it gets distorted and um that makes it more difficult for us to clearly see the night sky and so if you have less atmosphere between you and the sky you're actually able to see things a lot more clearly and sharply um and then the third really important one is actually moisture content in the air So again, um, when there's a lot of moisture or water content in the air, that can also distort images and make it difficult to to see clearly. Um, Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the things that makes like, for example, the the example you had of of the Chilean desert, that area meets all three of those criteria. It's at a high elevation. It has a low moisture content because it's a desert. 
and it's um, away from, you know, in, in that area, you can get away from population centers and really have less light pollution. But mm -hmm. you can find those areas all over the place, even just driving a couple hours out of a major city. If you drive a couple hours out, um, you're, you're very likely to be able to get into a, a space where it's dark enough that you can see the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's really something that's available to everyone. Right. And I'm curious, what are some of your favorite documentaries, space documentaries or programs? Um, yeah, let's see. Favorite documentaries. You know, to be honest, it's been a long time. I'm not much of a, <laughs> I'm not much of a watcher, which is not a very popular statement for someone my age. I, I, I'm, I'm, but <laughs> I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm not much of a watcher myself. Yeah. Um, I would say, though, that one that really stands out to me that if, for anyone, it's, it's quite an old one at this point, but it's one that I saw when I was a kid and um, I actually saw it in a planetarium. So I saw it on like the big domed screen where oh, you lay I love back those. on a chair. Oh, oh, yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. It was, yeah. um, the Hubble documentary is probably okay. like, hands down my favorite. And I think I it tells a great story. Yeah. It's it's really fantastic. It tells the story not just of the Hubble telescope, but also of the mission to fix it. Because once the mm. Hubble telescope was launched into space, it was discovered that there was actually a defect to one of the mirrors that caused it to not work as well as, as we would have hoped. Um, and NASA actually had to launch uh, an extra mission to fix the Hubble Space Telescope um, to go and recapture it, essentially, and to fix mm. it, and then to relaunch it into its, its trajectory. And so it... Um, it's really a great, it's a, it's a stunning, the images in the documentary are stunning and are another one of those instances where I feel like at least when I watched it, it helped to put me in, in that cosmic perspective that we talked yeah. about, about just how vast the universe is and all of that. Yeah. Um, and it also just tells a great story of the human spirit and the capability to persevere and all of that. What about Carl Sagan's cosmos? Cause that was what did it for me. My dad handed me the the DVD set when I was in college and he's like, this will change your life. Cause my dad loves astronomy. And he was like, he wanted me to get into it. And I watched that. Like I just binge watched nonstop for, cause it's, it's a lot, right. It's a, it's a, it's a yeah. box set. And I watched it for like a week or so. And I was just like, Oh my God. Like, I didn't know, like, you know, and what I loved about Carl Sagan is that he's also a philosopher, you know, he, he kind of, um, he has a very unique perspective on, on space and he kind of intertwines spirituality, uh, with, with space exploration, which really resonated with me. Um, but yeah, that was what did it for me. Um, and recently I listened to, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson. He had, he had this audio book that came out. I don't know if you remember, what is the title? That was also a really good, good book. Uh, the one that, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I don't remember the title of the book, but it was also quite. He's uh, written a couple recently and I'm trying yeah, to. Yeah, the recent one. one. Was his the most recent, recent the, yeah. The most recent one. Uh, yeah. Um, no, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of it right now. Me too. Well. <laughs> but I have to say that I'm glad you mentioned and brought up Cosmos um, with Carl Sagan because Absolutely. I think that that was such one of the things that I really love about that is that it was such an accessible series as well. It was something it was, that yeah. everyone could watch. And no matter what your background, it wasn't mm. just for people who were already space uh, enthusiasts or who had a background in science or anything like that. It was something that, um, you know, I was able to watch when I was really young and was able to see and feel inspired by and, and enjoy and all of that. And I know that that's like, like you said with you as well, that's a common experience that a lot of people have had. And um, he was really a, a master storyteller, I think. He really was, to, yeah. To weave together like the science side and then also the human side and, and that yeah. philosophical element and everything. And yes, um, yeah, we were really fortunate to have, <laughs> to have him. To absolutely. have him, absolutely. So speaking of books, you've written one. Uh, and it's titled Dream Big, How to Reach for the Stars. Love the title. <laughs> so Thank you. <laughs> so Abby, I want to know, according to you, what do you think it really takes to live the life of your dreams? Like what worked for you? 
Yeah, that's it's a great question. And again, it's not one that has a short or easy answer. I know. Of, <laughs> We're going in the deep end. Of, <laughs> right. <laughs> Getting right into it. Um, there are so many things that are important, but I think the most important, if, if I had to really drill into what I think the most important and, and a big portion of what my book really um, focuses on and is about is mindset. And okay. it's about having a growth mindset, having a tenacious spirit, which isn't just something I, I, I like to push back against the idea that there are some people who are born capable of reaching after their dreams and capable of being motivated. I think we're all able to do that. We're all able to, but we need to have the right skills and the right tools. And we need to have, it's, it's something that you can learn and that you can practice as well. Tenacity is absolutely a skill that if you don't practice, you're not going to develop and you're also not going to keep. Um, and so one of the reasons that I think that that's so important is, and it's something that I don't think we talk about enough is that uh, growth mindset and having a tenacious spirit are really important in the face of failure. And failure is inevitably a part of both life, but it's also a part of dreaming big and, and chasing after your dreams. And I think that oftentimes we look at failure and we think about it in a negative light and we think about, oh, well, failure means the end of the road. It means that you've messed up or something that you've done. is It's seen as like a personal failing when in reality, I think that it's actually um, a necessary part. It's a, it's a necessary and important step of chasing after your dreams and anything worth doing will have failure involved in it as well. And so to me, that's the most in, important um feature or facet of a dreamer is the ability to see failure and then to, to experience it and to use it as a stepping stone, I guess you could say in a growth point. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And unfortunately, um, in today's age, day and age, like people, younger generations, they want, they want that instant gratification of like, you know, fast success. And that doesn't happen, right? They forget that it's not, that things don't happen overnight, that you have to work at it and that you have to deal with those failures and those disappointments. And um, I, I, I don't know, I feel like that quality of resilience and being able to stick with things is kind of diminishing. And I'm, I, I hope I don't sound like, a, you know, a negative Nancy, but, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it seems to be the case because of social media and because of all the conveniences we have these days. Um, I feel like, uh, you know, kind of instilling that patience and that, that tenacity to really stick with, with things as we have to make more of an, more and uh, more effort educating and kind of training kids these days. And that's why I love the work that you're doing, because that certainly does, does that. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think that it's definitely important. Like I said, it's a skill. It's something that if, if we're not teaching kids and young people about and then also giving them opportunities to practice to practice you know failing and to practice also being tenacious and being resilient and also being committed then then we're doing a disservice um, and so that's one of the the things that I really focused on in my book was well what are the ways that we here and now can can take the time to in our daily lives to practice those skills and how is it that we're going to pass those along because I I agree that in some ways there is a, a culture of instant gratification that is yeah. um, definitely a part of the internet age that we're in and again it's um, it's not a good thing or a bad thing it just is the way that it is and there are a lot of pros and cons there's ups and downs to the internet um, but it's good to look at it honestly and to be able to say, well, what is it that we can do now to, to make sure that that moves in the right direction? And uh, I'm really glad that you asked about that and that we're talking about that because that's the first step is just to talk about it and to, to make sure that it's a conversation that's being had. Yeah, absolutely. And it seems like, you know, what you're talking about certainly worked for you because you've already accomplished quite a lot. You're like in your early to mid twenties, I mean, you've yeah. uh, spoken on some major platforms like TEDx and you have a pretty large following on social media, which is pretty much the holy grail for <laughs> influencers. Um, <laughs> so um, what advice do you have for those who are trying, you know, who are trying to build a name for themselves and a platform where they can speak about their own passions and the causes that they care about? 
Yeah, so what worked for me and and my best piece of advice for anyone out there who's looking to find their voice and build a platform and a community for for what, the things that they care about um, is to be authentic and to be honest. And um, that's really been the, the, the guiding star, pun intended, of my... <laughs> Um, my experiences with social media, I started um, sharing just in an honest way my journey towards becoming an astronaut on social media when I was about 13 years old. Again, with my mom's um, help, actually, she uh, she was sitting there with me when I set up my first Twitter account and I was dictating to her. She was typing on her computer, setting up my Twitter <laughs> account. And she says, okay. okay, what do you want your username to be? And I said, oh, I want it to be astronaut Abby because that was my childhood nickname and she yeah. types it in and then she looks at me and she says all right what do you want your bio to say and, and it was just really great to be able to be on social media at such a young age because I had the help of a parent who was able to help me to navigate, navigate that, that yeah and to really develop a healthy relationship with it as well um, and so I think that for me my my story started uh, on social media started early it started at 13 and my my goal and my method, I guess you could say the entire time has been this authentic view into yeah. what it's like to, to have this dream. And I'm, you know, one of the ways that I share that authentically, and I think that has been really a draw to people is that I do show the, the ins and outs, the ups and downs, and I show the long path that I'm on. It's not when you follow me and when you get invested in my journey and my dream, it's not an instant gratification event. It's not something where you start following me and I'm going to be an astronaut in two years or in six months or something like that. The people who have signed on to be a part of my journey through social media have, um, have the understanding that I'm on, I'm on the long road here that I'm still potentially a decade away from going to space. But the cool thing is that I'm able to share all of these steps along the way. I'm able to share, you know, graduating from college, becoming a pilot, becoming a, a rescue diver, becoming a scientist at Harvard Medical School, you know, all of these different things that I'm doing. And I think that's really what it's about is telling your story, showing, you know, your narrative, but doing it in an honest and authentic way. Yeah, I love yeah. that. And and I think your passion for what you do really comes through and people, people can feel that, you know? Yeah. And that's the other thing is that I, I hope that people can feel it because I, am yeah, I mean, I could, about, <laughs> <thank you. laughs> I'm very passionate about what I do and I'm, I'm yeah. very passionate about space and creating the opportunities in space for the next generation. And I think that that, what you said is that that comes through. That's true for anyone out there who's looking to make content or create a community through digital or social media. You have to, you have to have that passion and you have to do something that you can be excited. And again, it, it comes down to being authentically excited and authentically interested in, because I think that people can tell, and especially now, you know, my generation and the, and the next generation coming up under me who, who, you know, we're social media and we're kind of digital natives and having grown up with this around us our entire lives, there's just this innate sense that you can kind of tell when someone's, you know, actually excited and honest about something versus yeah. when someone's yeah. doing it for an we can We can spot a, or a wannabe, reason. ton of them yeah, out there. hundred <laughs> percent. And so that's the thing is that you just have to find yeah. what your niche is and what your interest is and what your passion is, and then find a way to, to tell your story that, that feels good and feels right. Yeah. And plus, I think you're also very unique because I, I mean, I haven't found a lot of people who speak about space the way you do um, and who's really invested in educating people about, about what it's, what it's like uh, and what the journey is like being on that path to becoming an astronaut. Uh, so I think your content is also very unique. I mean, I'm speaking as a content creator, so yeah. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And it definitely, I, I think you're right. It is really unique um, in the sense that also- I mean, you're not a fashion- influencer right. let's just put it that way <laughs> although my flight suit is very fashionable <laughs> I you know um, I agree with you I like it you know you could start a trend Abby <laughs> yeah you never know you but never I, know I think you're right that like my perspective especially of the way that I'm first off being a science influencer is already kind of a um 
a small community. It's a niche thing. There aren't it as really many of is. us as there are fashion bloggers or, or makeup um, influencers or stuff like Correct. that. But then also having the perspective that I have of being like a an up and coming, you know, working through the steps of becoming mm-hmm. a scientist and becoming an astronaut and getting to take everyone along with me on this journey is kind of a unique and incredible thing. And I hope that it makes my content relatable to young people who are following along with me and who are able to see themselves in me and are able to really kind of experience this with me, which is, it's a cool thing that we're able to do that with social media. And I just think it's, um, it's lucky to have that ability. Yeah. Now the playing field is kind of leveled and everyone has a chance to, you know, share their, share their thoughts and their ideas. So I think that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I really hope that you one day do make it to Mars. I mean, you really need to connect with Elon Musk or Richard Branson or someone like that. <laughs> <laughs> you can, you, then you can leapfrog. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, it's so, it's so exciting to see um, what's happening with private space industry right now. I think it's going to end up being really important and it's mm-hmm. actually Actually, it's really important to my dreams as well, because the whole idea within the United States with NASA, which is kind of my focus because I'm American and such, um, the idea with NASA is that the private space industry is a fantastic um, thing to be happening, because what it does is it allows NASA and the rest of, you know, the general public and also the world to have access to what's called low Earth orbit, So Mm -hmm. um, being in Earth orbit and also potentially even things like uh, going someday to the moon or such. Um, Mm. And then that that commercial access frees NASA up then to focus on other goals, to be able to say, okay, we have this ability to access low Earth orbit when we need to through private industry, which means that we can focus most of our effort on Mm -hmm. something like returning to the moon or putting humans on Mars. And so Mm -hmm. for someone who has a career goal as a professional astronaut of wanting to work for a space agency and and really um, not just visit space, but live and work in space, Mm -hmm. it's exciting for me to see that happening with the privatization right now because it it allows my dreams to kind of become true in the future as well. Yeah, Yeah. it makes it more reachable, right? Yeah, much more attainable to see that happening because it's it's really one of those things that you can only focus on so many things at a time. And that's true for it's true for us as humans, and it's also true for space agencies, that there is only so much capability at any given time. And so now that we're starting to kind of release the the responsibility for low Earth orbit we're able to focus and, and redirect to some of these other exploration um, patterns or, or plans, which is, yeah, it's exciting. It is so exciting. Oh my gosh, Abby, honestly, I could talk to you all day. You are so <laughs> inspiring and you're so intelligent. Oh my God, just a breath oh. of fresh air. I mean, I really appreciate you taking the time to be here to share your story with us and also inspiring us to look up at the night sky just a little longer. Yeah, well, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to come. And again, I could talk with you all day as well. Um, oh. But I really appreciate the opportunity to to talk with you and to share my story and my my love and passion for space. And I hope that everyone who is listening is going to take just even 30 seconds tonight or soon and look up at the night sky and kind of share that cosmic perspective with all of us here on Earth. Absolutely. And I also want to mention that if anyone listening wants to learn more about Abby's uh, book, Dream Big, How to Reach for Your Stars, you can visit her website, um, astronautabby.com. Absolutely. And if anyone listening again, I'll, I'll put a plug in as well. Um, please definitely check out my website and my book. And then also take a look at my nonprofit website, which is themarsgeneration.org. Yes. And there's a lot of really great opportunities of how to get involved with space and ways to share that with your community um, that can be, can be found there. Wonderful. Abby, thank you so much. And I hope you enjoyed the rest of your day. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Bye.